Welcome to another Black Magic Collective panel. Uh, we have some wonderful guests today here to talk about remote production. My name is Chris Edgar, by the way. Um, me and uh, Jen Page, the director of Black Magic Collective, have a feature film called Playing with Beethoven that's coming out uh, in theaters in November. Um, so we work together a lot. What I primarily do is music composing, but I also do some producing and like everybody else involved in indie film, uh, wear many, many hats. Um, so that that's a little bit about me. Um, how about you? Uh, if you're here, please uh, sound off in the chat and let us know what you are up to, what your role in filmmaking is, because we are a filmmaking and TV collective. Uh, we're streaming this live on Facebook and YouTube, so you can put your comments on the box or in the box there, as the case may be. Uh, we meet regularly on the business and craft of filmmaking with education events that focus on the tech side. Membership in the Black Magic Collective is free. And if you join right now, you are eligible to win a seat of Da Vinci Resolve, which is, I mean, you, you, if you're in filmmaking, specifically in post, you're probably already aware of what that is. Uh, hi, Sheila. Hi, Mark. Um, we're just uh, responding to some YouTube comments there. If you join right now, you are going to be eligible to win a seat of Da Vinci Resolve, as I was saying, which is our, uh, which is the Black Magic editing suite. But of course, it does uh, much, much more than that. Uh, submissions are now open for the Black Magic Collective Film Festival. We pick one film each month to showcase, and also, uh, you, if you enter a film, are going to be eligible to have it shown in our film festival, which is going to be in November. Our top ten finalists are going to screen there. Uh, hi, Shadow Mihayu, uh, producer, director, planning a number of live and pre-recorded productions. Well, um, remote production is what we're here to talk about, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, we want to say a special thank you, as always, to our sponsor, Black Magic Design, which is a rare company that loves filmmakers, and they're why we get to do everything that we do at no cost to filmmakers. Uh, they're giving away a seat of resolve to one of you today, so please stay tuned, and we'll announce the winner at the end. Uh, and with that, we'll go into introducing our wonderful guest today. Uh, the first guest that I'll introduce is Ben Consoli. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of uh, a sense of what, what, what Ben has been up to, uh, storytelling through video production and podcasting is the best way to inform and engage an audience. This has been Ben Consoli's mantra. As creative director of BC Media Productions, Ben has been responsible for award-winning commercials and videos for companies like Amazon, Nestle, and Honda. And as host of the Go Creative Show podcast, Ben has interviewed hundreds of the top filmmakers in the world. Hi, Ben, and welcome. Hi, thank you so much. And hearing people read your bio is like the weirdest thing ever. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It's all true, uh, but it's always so strange when someone reads it. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of writing my own bio. Um, <laughs> it's the worst. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, no, de definitely, uh, you, you, you've got some, you've got some impressive credits in there. So you know, why not? Uh, why not shout them out to the world? Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking to you guys today. Uh, with that, why don't I introduce our second guest, Jason LaCorey, who is the president and head of innovation at C-Mount. In this role, he has successfully positioned C-Mount as a leading custom gear solutions provider. Uh, Jason and his team have designed bespoke video installations across platforms, including The Late Late Show with James Corden, the 2020 Emmys, Ellen, Jimmy Kimmel, and Apple Music's Carpool Karaoke, the series, Hermes, and Snapchat. So welcome, Jason. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Chris. Good to see you, Ben. Yes, you too. Uh, and finally, last but not least, we have Michelle Stapleton. Um, Michelle started her career in the advertising agency at the tender age of 17. Working with the infamous director, Tony Kay, she worked her way up to producing from reception. She then joined Propaganda Films when they launched in London, working with the likes of Alex Proyas, David Fincher, Michael Bay, and Mark Romanek. Uh, at 26 years old, she ventured out on her own, starting up Brave Films, which soon became one of London's leading production companies, earning Best Newcomer in its first year. Um, and then I'll go down a few lines uh, because there are so many wonderful credentials and, and, uh, and projects in here. Uh, Michelle's passion for high standards of work is still as strong today as it has always been. And in 2013, she teamed up with two like-minded businesswomen, Carly Stone and Pippa Bot, to launch Madam Films, which I believe, Michelle, is your current uh, production company. It certainly is. Thank you for having me, Chris and Ben and Jason. Lovely to be on this panel with the 
two of you as well. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, why don't we start because we are because we are talking about remote production, which of course in these you know interesting times that we live in has become more and more common. And it's obviously a broad subject matter, like we you know just doing rehearsals and other aspects of pre-production remotely that could be thought of as remote production. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have actually operating camera and other equipment from a remote location. So I, I'm curious to know. Um, it, what, what's the most sort of interesting remote production thing that you feel like you've done? Uh, why, why don't we start? Why don't we start with you, Ben? Well, the most interesting one that I did so far was a project for Dior hmm. because it was the most challenging. First of all, Giselle Bunchen was the host, which was cool to work with her. But we had five different people in different parts of the world. There were three in the U.S., one in France, and one in Shanghai. And just the the amount of effort and logistics to like get everyone together to communicate seamlessly film independently at each person's home and have no crew they had to do these things themselves it was i can i honestly can't even believe it happened when i look back um but for those reasons it is definitely the most interesting and probably my favorite so far yeah and, and so to do that shoot did you send gear to all of those people in all those different locations or did you sort of give them tips on how to set up their own gear? Both, yes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in Shanghai, they use their own gear. We, we hired a rental company and basically a PA came and set it up and then left the room. Mm -hmm. But we were sending out iPhone film kits, um, mm -hmm. a laptop and a separate microphone. They wanted two angles at each place. So there was two phones, laptop, um, Everybody was feeding through both Zoom and OpenReel, which I'm sure mm -hmm. we'll get to. That's the platform that I use is OpenReel mm -hmm. for my iPhone filmmaking. And basically we had Zoom, um, OpenReel, two cameras at each location and worked with them the day before to get everything set up so that they could just arrive and turn it on. Um, but it was, it was pretty wild. <laughs> it was a feat. I, I don't know how we did it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's hard to believe what people are doing as far as remote production is concerned. It's it's, it's pretty wild, like you say. Um, how about you, Michelle? Uh, what, what would you say was the most interesting remote production? You oh worked on? gosh, I mean, um, there are you know we've been working continuously since the since we came out of the first lockdown actually. So so we've had a combination of either um, remote directors or obviously lots of remote clients. Um, uh, very varying degrees of remote people, but but I generally have been on set, so it's been coordinating between, say, maybe a crew of over a hundred crew to to your minimal crew of like maybe five or six, where you're doing an a intimate remote interview in somebody's house. So the complexities of it are so varied. Although I have to say, you know, at the end of the day. We're filmmakers, and and as such, you want to be on set with those people. It's about a face-to-face -face connection, really. But I I am in awe of the technology. I mean, how quickly this came about um, to allow us to go back to work in order to accommodate people. As Ben was saying, you're never on the same same time zone. I mean, Madam now for facilitates jobs so so we're a service company so our clients come to the UK to shoot and we we facilitate that shoot for them so of course all of our clients are overseas so mm -hmm. we, we have people on several diff different time zones as Ben was saying so co not only like coordinating that but making sure that you know what it's like you phone someone and it's your morning and it's their evening you're in a very different headspace so, you know, and, and for a director to be able to, um, you know, contain that set and, and for production to be able to contain that set and make it run smoothly, you know, it's extraordinary. But as I said, the technology is, it's been incredible. It's blown my mind. It, it's not something that I would say I would, you know, if you're asking me if I'd like all of, all of my crew and my director and everyone and my cast on set with me, Call me old fashioned, I think I'd say yes, I'd quite like that. But as I said, the, the technology and not only just having your 
the people that you need on set at the time, but your post-production people. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, we've I've been on shoots where I've needed a lot of special effects. So I've had to have my post guys with us remote. And, you know, the just even the playback and, and being able to layer and, and you know, to, to, to do plate shots and to see what it was going to look like, you know, from different countries on different time zones. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, it, it's amazing this said i the technology just seemed to develop i don't know whether you guys thought this but even with zoom people didn't really know how to use zoom and everyone was talking at the same time and very quickly we learned how to use it but the technology to come and live stream like ben was saying we have we use like q take or what have you you know there's different platforms but you've got one link that is going straight into the camera so like you would be watching playback on set so that's one set that you've got for your all of your remote um clients and casts or you know crew but then you've got your zoom because they need to be able to communicate with you yeah. so not just looking through the camera they need to be able to say what they're seeing and and feed that back to you yeah. so so the technology that came about in order for us to do that and utilize it was mind-blowingly fast i just can't quite still like fathom how we we just went remote it's like oh yeah we can do it you know and it, it but it's extraordinary yeah and so you were directing on set primarily but then you had people from all different time zones on a zoom call and they were also watching picture uh through Absolutely. some through two separate apps yeah yeah, so we would always feed directly into the camera. So so it would be like if you're my client now, you're you're not with me, but we're on this kind of Zoom, but but you've also got another platform and a page that you can go to so that you can see directly into the camera as you would do if you were sitting on set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, it's, yeah, it, it is amazing like you say how how quickly all of this has progressed. Uh, we didn't lose any time I and mean, we were literally talking we had i think for all of us we had only three months where like globally we were in a lockdown mm -hmm. and for the uk anyway that july when films came back that you know from march to july once the features came back and the dramas came back commercials came back production started happening and uh, uh, again and we we haven't stopped since then so mm -hmm. It was really three months that people had to develop a system whereby we could continue without having key people on our sets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's pretty amazing how quickly all this is ramped up. Um, how about you, uh, Jason? Uh, what would you say would be the most interesting remote thing that you've done? Um, yeah, uh, to Michelle's point, like it, it, everything, once we went into lockdown here in the US, uh, started to progress really quickly. And we work across so many platforms so from the talk shows uh, to little interviews that needed to happen. We just had to get to work trying to figure that out uh, very quickly. And as the technology evolved and people started getting on Zoom and Zoom evolved and got better, we started finding ways to uh, advance that technology. And then I'd say the most interesting project was uh, the, uh, the Emmys, the 2020 Emmys. Um, which happened very quickly because the production wasn't sure if they were going to move forward with a remote solution. And then, um, you know, we had, we had discussed it sort of way off in the distance. And then all of a sudden there was like three weeks out and we really had to figure out uh, across, you know, 120 nominees across the world, how we were going to get them equipment, um, how we were going to make them look better, sound better, how we were going to bring it into the show uh, and interact live with Jimmy Kimmel there. Uh, it, so that was sort of, probably by far the most interesting, challenging, um, and exciting project that we worked on uh, in sort of the height of the, the lockdown. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. what, when you were doing that, that live event, I mean, which is obviously a huge, huge scale project. I mean, so what, what were the proportions as far as people who were remote and people who were on set? Uh, nearly everyone was remote besides mm -hmm. a few talent that would interact at the Staples Center. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, nearly all the nominees, I believe it was, it was upwards of 100 to 120 or something like that. Now we broke that up in territory. So we handled all of Los Angeles. We had around 30 kits or something like that that went out around the Los Angeles area. Um, and then there was another company uh, handling sort of the East Coast and then uh, a company in the Netherlands handling 
more of the European side of things, uh, as well as Australia and a few other places. Um, so we, we all had to also interact together and to be speaking on comms in real time. And to Michelle's point, getting people to rehearse uh, and to troubleshoot uh, in the, all the different time zones, including talent, having to wake up you know, at all hours of the morning to say, okay, we're going to do our tech rehearsal now, you know, three hours before the show or something like that could have been four in the morning for somebody. Um, so that was sort of an interesting uh, uh, hurdle to overcome, uh, as, as we know, you know, so you're, the tech's out there knocking on the door to deliver something and talent's not, not quite uh, on the same page as us. So those sorts of, <laughs> those sorts of hurdles, but um, that was, uh, yeah, that was an incredible sort of logistical feat, I'll yeah. say. Yeah, that does, that does sound pretty incredible. Um, and I think you were just starting to talk about this, Ben, um, but I was curious about what type of software you typically use when you've got part of the crew remote and part of the crew on set um, to make sure that you have a really high quality video stream going to the remote people. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to very quickly, Michelle had mentioned just how fast the transition to remote was. Yeah. I don't think people realize that. It was within a matter of weeks, there needed to be an actual solution for remote production because no one was stopping. Production people were like, okay, we'll quarantine for a little bit, but we need to continue working and we have to figure out how. And yeah. there was really very little time. Everybody was scouring the internet to find any solution at all. What can we do? And over that really short period of time, some amazing, amazing products have come out. Yeah. One of which was around beforehand. And that's what I've, I've used, but certainly when the need became so great um, during the pandemic, um, the software package that I use is called OpenReal. And what it allows you to do that really I have not found in any other platform is it allows you to use an iPhone, but mm -hmm. remotely control it seamlessly. The shutter speed, the, the temperature, the ISO, the focus, the zoom, you can completely control it, not even just start and stop, which is the basics, but all the little elements that make it look even better. You can control all of those things remotely, seamlessly, quickly through the app. And the best part about that is you're not cobbling together like a million different programs. It's just mm -hmm. one program. It's a free program for the person on the other end to download on their phone. Everybody has an iPhone. And if they don't, you can send them one inexpensively. And it's such, yeah. just such a simple platform to use. The benefit is it records internally on the phone. So you get 4K quality online without any interruption whatsoever. So you don't need to worry about Zoom hiccups. So that is the reason why we invested so heavily in OpenReal is because of that capability. Now, yes, you are limited to an iPhone. So there is a particular look that comes with it. We've certainly pushed those boundaries, but especially during the height of the pandemic, that at-home look was not only what everybody was yeah. doing, but you kind of wanted that. So yeah. it was a perfect place and time. So for us, it's open reel and it's this little iPhone filmmaking kit, which is about probably, this is probably like the sixth iteration of this, but it's the phone, a Zoom H1N tied in, and that's it. This is what I send them. Additional lights, maybe, but that's it. So it's a really self-contained unit. Now, if anybody is interested in Open Real, I have to mention this because it can get a little expensive, let's be real. If any of you guys out there have looked into it, I can because I've been working with them for so long and I have a great relationship with them, I can get you a pretty significant discount, but you have to go directly to me, otherwise it's not going to work, it's not going to apply. So if you are interested and you do want to take advantage of it, do it. now. I'm not paid by Open Real. I have nothing to do with them. I just basically, because of my podcast, was like, I want to talk about this and I want to be able to offer people some sort of a discount. So that is the deal that we have. So I needed to put that out there. I know it's a shameless, but I wish I was plugging my own company. But no, I'm <laughs> plugging something that you guys can use. But also, I'm glad you got that off your chest, Ben. I have to. <laughs> I got to get it out there. The, the beauty of that, though, as you said, it allowed, you know, it allowed... Um, filmmakers to carry on or well and advertisers you know that there was no stopping I mean we all I mean I'm assuming this but um from what you've just said I'm assuming I'm going to be right that in the UK here most of the you know big brands were advertising with people filming themselves at home 
they yeah. were the commercials. So, you know, and, and one, and it was great. And after a while, yes, people got a little bit fed up with it. And, and but we mustn't forget to pay homage to the, to the real creativity of people that do direct and their vision and their, you know, their capabilities of that. And, the, and, and also in every department of filmmaking, that there is somebody there that, that has worked very hard for that position. And, and there is, you know, you, you, one doesn't like to um, dilute the um, expertise of each department because, you know, as you've said, you know, you, you can all film at home, Ben, and that is great. Doesn't mean to say it's going to be a great film, though. So, I mean, and I, I have to say I stand up for the creativity very strongly as a, as a producer and now a service producer, but I do find sometimes, um, you know, especially today, you know, there is so much kind of moving image out there that one becomes a little less wowed. And I, I find that a bit sad. You know, it's like, especially with children, you know, they're, they're so savvy with, with technology. And, you know, we know that, you know, we do something remote and we're kind of like takes a few days and then it's amazing. They just seem to do it immediately. You know, it's almost like, you don't have to read the instructions. <laughs> so annoying. But they just don't, do they? But but I'm kind of digressing. But but I love the fact that that that, that is because when w before the phones, before you could, before people could do that themselves, we were literally outside doing remote, putting putting the cameras in, setting the cameras for the cast within their own homes, and then being outside with the focus pullers, still being able to remotely focus pull and and you know. Um, set the cameras for them so that the any cast member inside the house wasn't having to actually operate the camera themselves but you know both works doesn't it i mean what a great thing as you say you've got the the iphone thing works and 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 even with the you're saying i know it's only an iphone but my gosh the images on those things these days are mind-blowing aren't they yeah. No, yeah. I, I think that's a really good point, actually, because, you know, as you we're all saying, you know, it, it was this accelerated sort of uh, advancement of this technology where it was like, OK, we need to get some people shooting themselves jump. So we got some phones or we're sending, you know, small RXO kits, something to make it look better. And then each week it said, OK, all right, we've got a head in the box now. That, that, that's that's what last last week. We're sick of that look. <laughs> now, how do we get an area in there? I want it to look like a commercial again. Um, but to Michelle's point, which which is as it progressed for us, we same thing with Ben. We had small. Every iteration was different and better. It was a, an iPhone. It was an RXO. It was a GoPro looking both ways so we could see two angles. It was Perfect. bringing in a switcher. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and then. Um, and then by the time we were getting to things like the Emmys and the Golden Globes, which we helped out as well, it was like, how do we make this more cinematic? Um, and, and then we, it did become more of a hybrid approach where we did bring all these technicians and these artists who have been developing the skills to Michelle's point, these directors, these lighting directors, these focus pullers who have these skills that, that you can't really replace. And, um, and, but we were able to integrate them and, and really catch everyone up to speed. So we had a camera that could get delivered into someone's house and have a pan and tilt head, have a DP frame it, have some scenic people, art directing, even if it was the, you know, the talent at home, bringing in a lamp, um, and then the, a, a director being able to see multiple feeds from around the world and switch that live um, and speak live. You know, Unity, if we're getting in the software, we use Unity comms, and that's one of the best uh, uh, comms apps I've used. And, you know, they're using it for the Olympics now, and that, that, that was a lifesaver for us because it put us back and the mentality of being on set. Because when you're on set and you're on PL, you're not necessarily seeing everybody, but we're all communicating, we're all on the same page. So even if we were across the world, that really allowed us, you know, for say, you know, for the larger productions that we worked on, uh, the Emmys and the, and the Globes, we were uh, sending these kits out all over the place. Um, and then we were able to talk live to the truck. And in our case, you know, we sent out a kit with a Blackmagic uh, Cinema Pocket camera with an ATEM slapped onto every single one of them. We could control the camera remotely. And I could speak on comms to the truck. And they say, hey, Jason, you know, go to Jennifer Aniston's house. Let's take a little red out. And then give me a little green. And we were sitting there painting across the internet. Um, but again, that very skilled person in the truck and a very skilled person, a technician uh, on the ground remote but still utilizing uh, intangible skills that you can't replace. Yeah, um, yeah. You know. So I think it, it was really a great convergence of, of, of art and technology and, uh, and skills 
uh, that our industry uh, like can't like no other industry could provide in that yeah. fast of a, fast of a time. And I was like baptism by fire. It's like go make it look uh, you know it's got to look like a movie now. I don't care it's if it's over the internet. It's amazing how quickly it went from get me any image you can anything <laughs> to exactly. Can we get an Alexa in there? Like what can, can we find it? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was so yeah. fast. But exactly. actually, I kind of found a split in my company because I mean, before this, we just did traditional production. We were doing commercial production. We had no ever in a million years think we'd be doing virtual with phones. <laughs> but there definitely was a split. As companies like yours, Jason, started developing these really nice kits for super high quality imagery, I started working on like what's the least expensive, quickest yeah. way in the door because – that way we can kind of handle that, you know, zero to ten thousand dollar budget. And then yeah. once you get above that, I'd be just renting from from you and and doing yeah. it that way. So that kind of it worked in our favor because it was a lot in the Boston market. You're doing a lot of corporate, you're doing a lot of small things, and you're yeah. you're solving a ton of problems that are just like, we got someone we need to interview tomorrow. We have no, you know, no budget, no equipment, no way to talk to them. How do you do it? Yeah, exactly. To your point, it became just like regular production, where it was like, hey, we got this kind of budget, we got this kind of budget. And so we needed to cover all our bases, but in a whole new way. Um, so yeah, and, the, and I've seen the kits that you sent on, they're brilliant. And, um, you know, and it's like, it's, yeah, you needed everything in, in, in between, you know, so it's, no, it's, it was it, really it's, amazing. Do, do you not, do you think you have to be really careful with, with those clients to, you know, like, it, it's, um, you know, you're, for, for their expectations, you know, not not yeah. over, overly deluding. Like, okay, you're you're going into a. I'm not being rude here, but you're going into a Skoda showroom. You can't afford the Ferrari. You you know, there is a difference between these two. And and as I said, we we have to be, um, you know, just very diligent with our and protective of our craft and our crews and our yeah. and and the people that come up with with not only the, this technology but continuing technology that that we build on that i mean look it, it's, it was almost like a you know it's always when something happens in war the technology just goes tenfold doesn't it and and we were in a war situation and and but the development of it as we all agreed was was so incredibly quick and has been is being finessed all of the time to the point that we don't even know where it where it's going to go tomorrow and and there are you know some joys of like for me being you know in a post production doing a doing a telecine the other day and it, it actually do you know what it made me think that sometimes on set if um and i'm not being rude to clients or or anyone i'm i'm you know we're, we're all in this i always see it as a very you know we are working together and it's a team i'm not you know i'm not working for you know we're we're all, our end game is to produce the best film we can, whether it's a feature, whether it's content, whether it's a commercial, whether it's, you know, wh whether it's a, a banner or, or what have you. But um, the attention to detail when certain people aren't on set, feeling that they need to have an opinion has made it actually so much smoother. You know, you, you dial them in, you're, as I said, we were grading, we dialed in, look, can you guys, can you have a look at the section now? We're ready to show you. Everyone was so, so cooperative and it, it just felt so much more seamless than when everyone's either in the suite or everyone's on the set, everyone's got to have a little say. Yeah. You know, it, that for me has been a really interesting, because I was really worried about, my gosh, you know, We've only got a certain amount of hours on set. If everyone has an opinion and they're on, you know, they're remote and we've we've got different time zones and people are coming in and out, you know, this this could be a very long day. Hmm. But people were so supportive and so collaborative, and actually the comments that were fed back were so relevant. You know, there was a lot less, um, yeah, just chat for argue for, for chat sake yeah i i couldn't agree with you more the two things i was most concerned with when this whole thing happened was how are clients going to communicate um with the onset crew and is this going to dumb down budgets are people going to find that you can do a lot more for a lot less and 
I found to start there that that did not happen. If anything, it justified the roles of all the professionals. Because when you don't have an art director, when you don't have an audio tech, when you don't have a real cinematographer, you figure it out. You, you realize it right away. So I think it helped to justify the real true costs that people in my budget range are always trying to fight for. It justified those. And then yeah. on the other end of it, I thought the client communication, honestly, if there's a silver lining, it's that clients have realized they don't need to be on set all the time. And, and the comments they're making are based on the frame, not just what yeah. they see in the room and when they're in their eyes, but the yeah. actual frame. And um, I think that's a great benefit to the experience that we all had. And hopefully it sticks around for a while. Yeah, I think I did experience more positive than negative th through that process that's for sure yeah yeah in, in terms of keeping communications more concise and yeah. more focused on the actual production yeah well, and, and you know what i think people were very much more aware of of the timing mm. situation that there were there was that it felt people were way more considerate to what everyone was doing what everyone had done each time we do remote filming what that has entailed and and what people have done to pull it all together like you jason all of the cameras you're saying at any one time you know dropping them all off putting them all in making sure you know that is a massive massive production not only that if one person as we are testing every day turns up to be positive the knock-on effect for that entire drop-off process could totally shut that entire production down. You know, it's enormous. And, and you know, we, we are still working through that. And look, we, we can be sitting here as an industry complaining, or not complaining, but saying how much our workload's gone up, appreciating the fact that there are so many industries out there that have not worked a day since, since this virus has really taken hold which is equally, you know, if not more, it's all heartbreaking. No, nothing is better or worse, but it is phenomenal what, you know, the levels of which people have up their game and achieved and, you know, and, and gone through to keep productions live and keep them going, no matter what the circumstances, live, going remote, being on set, or, you know, the whole, whole, um, all areas of it is just extraordinary and, and we i think you know we we have to kind of top our hats to everyone and you know we we we've carried on and and it's been really hard and and also just not as i said not in our industry but knowing people that haven't been able to work when when we are most probably i think at our busiest at the moment it's crazy Production is so well suited to problem solving. Like this is yeah. just kind of what we do. And I'm sure Jason can even talk more to this because when problems arise, you, I'm sure you get the brunt of it. People want to know, why can't I hear this person? Why can't, there's got to be so much of that going on. But I don't know. I just feel like production can weather storms. We just seem to have that kind of attitude and we're just able to do it. Luckily, thankfully. Yeah. yeah it's, no, I, it's problem solving. That That's what production is. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree with that. It's like, and I'm so proud to be part of that kind of industry because like you're saying, it was, it was so much communication and everybody it was, you know, this collaborative effort. Nobody was complaining. It was like, how, how do we solve this? How can we do better? You know, vendors talking to other vendors. It wasn't really a competition. I'm going to keep this a secret. It was like, Hey guys, how can we all work together to, to make this seamless for our clients? Everybody subcontracting from each other or helping design things. Um, across different platforms it was really amazing and 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 just the crews you know having to deal with the extra testing and all that kind of stuff but you know that, and again like that's one of the we talked about this sort of on our last panel with the black magic folks it was like for the shows like the emmys and the golden globes which are such massive productions that was like the best feeling about that we were able to employ several several uh different disciplines from all across the industry that had been out of work for six months, eight months, and we were getting focus pullers, we were getting DPs, we were getting like, just not just like a couple camera guys, a couple techs. It, we were bringing in everybody that needed to be there um, and getting people back to work. And that was really uh, the best part of it for us. It was just like, yeah, we're, we're coming up with some cool solutions, but we're also helping out 
uh, our industry, which was a really nice feeling and probably the best part of the remote production experience for us. Yeah. Oh yeah, I totally agree. There were so many emails yeah. back and forth. People like, you know, producers that wouldn't have any reason to really communicate beforehand would be calling and being yeah. like, what are you using? How are you doing this? What's happening? Yeah. Um, I know the Mass Production Coalition here in Boston, well, in Massachusetts, um, had a lot of just, you know, Zoom calls open to the public too, of just like, yeah. what are people doing? And how, how are we, how are we going to get through this? So it was, it was cool. I mean, when you're in the thick of it, it's the scariest, worst thing ever, but now, yeah. you know, not out of it, but getting out of it, looking back, you're kind of like, that was kind of amazing <laughs> that that oh, was yeah. able to happen. A hundred percent. Yeah. I, we helped in the early days, we helped a lot of the, the, the late night talk shows get back on the air and uh, we were having several conversations and zooms with other talk shows. Hey, what are you guys using? How can we make this better? And, and some of the stuff just, you know, like we said, at, at first it was like, we we're just happy to have a, a face on camera, but then it was like, how can we have a game show and bring in a bunch of strangers into our zoom, change the boxes, do this. You know, we were going, Oh, I, I guess we could do that. I have no idea. Oh, then we did a, we did an uplink with the, the space station. Like, you know, like it was, it was yeah, zero to a hundred in, in, you know, a week. Yeah. It was crazy. I want to know, we talked about our, our favorite projects that we did. I want to know uh, what the first ones were like, what, what was the first remote project you were asked to do? And like, what was it? How did you, how did you handle it? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. What, I guess whichever one wants to jump in, first, whatever wants to jump in first. I can't even remember. The trial by fire. Yeah. That, that, that I cool. think, I think mm -hmm. for us, I want to say, I, I believe it was the, the late, late show with James Corden. They did a, they did a, a home fest special uh, from James's garage and we had to try to figure out how to bring in different celebrities from all around the world. Um, and we weren't quite up to speed with zoom, but at that point, cause this is, you know, this is a couple of weeks in. Um, so I think we set up uh, some, some small rigs kind of like yours, Ben, where we sent out <laughs> really rudimentary. There was like a, a Sony RXO on a, on a, on a, uh, a mini tripod with a cell phone just below it. And James would uh, fa FaceTime in with the producers. So we would have the live interaction that we would film with say, you know, John Legend and he'd play a song and then they'd have their chit chat and then we'd shoot the, the studio portion later and kind of bring it together. And then we were bringing in somebody else and uh, some of it was live, some of it was live to tape. It, it was just figuring out things like that, like little small rigs and phones just to communicate to get the eyeline right, um, just, just to get it in the can and, and turn it around as quick as possible. I mean, what's interesting there is obviously the networks just assumed someone will sort this out. We, we can carry on. We're, we're not stopping. I mean, we're not going to just do reruns. That's not happening. We oh, can no, the network said we got we got we got orders to film and, here. You and, got episodes. And, you still owe us those episodes. Yeah, yeah, and and people that we know out there, they're going to sort it for us. Yeah, yeah. So the, like, the, the challenge was given to you, and you rose to the challenge, and you. You made it work. I mean, you know, it's it's as you're saying, Ben. It's 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 problem solving, and that's what production's always been about. And it's like if I don't know how to do it, I know someone who can. Exactly. And let's think about that. That that's the beauty of the whole technology. As long as it, as we were saying, it doesn't get um, kind of abused in a way that you know, I don't know. It just gets used in the right way for the right reasons, and not like you were saying earlier, Ben, that people don't just. Um, use it just to think, oh, I can make a really great film really cheaply. Do you think, Michelle, that from that now, even, I guess, do you, what about remote production do you think you're going to continue using moving forward? Yeah, I do. And you know what? I think um, moving away from COVID in terms of like climate change and trying to have a better carbon footprint for film, which we all know film has not got a great carbon footprint, but to be able to reduce that carbon footprint with clients flying in to places that they don't necessarily need to be, absolutely. I think it will, it's key moving forward to helping us, um, you know, continue a better um, understanding of, of what we're doing to this planet and reducing um, emissions and, yeah, uh, people going, um, as you said, on set when they don't need to. And, and actually, I think people will more and more that they 
um, it's about feeling included, isn't it? And, and a part of something. And I think that the more people are used to having the Zoom and the remote links as part of everyday life and, and that becoming the norm on set will, yeah, will, will hopefully um, mean that, that it moves forward in, in, a, in, a, in a positive, as I said, carbon footprint um, way. You'd mentioned, um, you had mentioned that you were using QTake. I've used it twice and I liked it, but I'm curious, like what, I guess what, how did you end on, how did you end up using QTake versus Zoom? It sounded like you, it was sort of a combination of the two, which is what we did. But what, yeah. Well, well, the QTake, there are two. We, we've got a company that's hijacked that, that do something else. So QTake is, um, that that's the link straight into the camera, basically. So that gives you your playback feed from camera. So, so you would be watching. So if we had these four um, uh, screens now in front of us, Zoom, you, you, you can just see me, you know, on set and I can communicate with you. But the actual cue take is literally, it's your live feed from the camera. So, so you'd be seeing that on your playback monitor. So there's no communication through QTake, communications no. through Zoom. Okay, so that, that makes yeah. sense because that's how we used it as well. Um, are you using that too, Jason? How are you sending, like what are you using to send your feed from place to place? Yeah, we've used that in, in conjunction with like VTR guys. We'll use that a lot um, uh, on sets and that's more of a traditional sort of streaming end-to-end -end solution. But uh, what this whole situation brought uh, around is that streaming wasn't good enough anymore because we needed two-way communication. So yeah, we, we used, uh, sometimes it was just a Zoom link or YouTube or, or those things to get it out. But we would basically just take our cameras in to either a multi-view or if it's just an A camera situation. And then we just uh, would convert that with a USB capture device. And then we would send that. Uh, most of the time, if I'm in a multi-cam situation, I will send that to a multi-viewer and then uh, I will I will convert that with a capture device and then I can scroll through any of those. I can pu punch up any camera or just send them multi-split um, to yeah. our directors offsite. Um, so that's kind of the minimalist solution for that. And then, you know, for talk shows, say we would set up multiple zooms in the same link and we'd just have like dummy computers there. Uh, so like we could still have, a, like I'm looking at a laptop that's just under lens right now. So I basically on the talk shows would set this up as our, our, our stage manager uh, and it would be, I could mute and unmute that remotely. I could control all the computers on set remotely not being there and mm -hmm. I could open that up. So like if we're in rehearsals, it would just be like it would be on set for the host where uh, the EP would, you know, actually let's go back to that joke and let's change this two words. And then the writer could chime in, but their face was following along with, you know, whatever video chat we were using, whether it be Zoom or, or uh, one of the others where it was just following whose voice was in. So that allowed us sort of a more natural interaction for the host. And then we could just mute that when it wasn't in use uh, and then send all feeds uh, back to the studio as well as just to multi feeds to all the producers offsite. Mm. Um, cool. cool. Yeah. Uh, why don't we, why don't we take a, a question from the audience here? This sure. is from Sabrina Louise church. Uh, how did you find the post part of a project VFX grade, et cetera, and sharing with clients to get feedback? keeping the momentum and watching the time and money on a project? I mean, I, I, the post was the easiest part. Yeah. Like that, that was the easy, because it was kind of already remote in a lot of instances. So Frame.io is the tool that I use. I'm sure like everybody's using that or at least Amazing. heard of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the post was the easiest part, at least for me. I mean, I don't, but I'm also doing really short things. You know, I'm doing mm -hmm. commercials and 10, 10 minutes or less type of projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm the same. I, know, I have to say, I found it quite wonderful that you were allowed to be on, you know, your your post was, you know, grade or what have you on your computer. You were able to do other work um, and you dipped in and out as and when there was something to, to view and comment on. And it was amazing. And, and we we posting was, you know, um, clients in one country, director in another country, post house in another country, production in an, you know, so we, we were across four or five different countries when we were doing our post and it was absolutely amazing. It, it was brilliant. And, and for me, you know, better than just, you know, 
I mean, rude, but sitting in a telecine suite all day long, you know, yeah. really, do I need to do that? And again, on the carbon footprint thing, that what a great thing. I did it from my house. Everyone, the, exactly the same level of job was done as obviously in, you know, on set and everything, but we, we didn't move. We didn't go anywhere. Yeah. Did you have any particular workflow, Michelle, for, um, for, grading because that was that was kind of that was the only pain point and post because everyone's looking at it on a different monitor i'm just curious if there's any way to kind of streamline that a little bit not streamline but uh, what's the word so that it so everybody's looking at a similar image as much well, as possible okay, but that's so again we were on zoom we had one zoom set up but then we we cutate so we went straight into the monitor so it, i was looking at the monitor um, as as the director was um, completely. So, and actually even better than we would have been if we'd have been in the telecine suite because he zoomed up that monitor onto our screen. So we were, we were seeing directly on there. I mean, the image was beyond crisp. It was insane. And every dial, every every millimeter of the dial, if we were, if he was crushing the contrast a little bit more, or if he was doing a little bit more brightness, or if he was like sectioning a piece to put a tiny bit of color in, it was amazing. I was absolutely blown away. What were your monitors? Did you and the director have the same monitor? Or did you just buy no, the exact same? I was just looking at it from my computer screen. Oh, okay. We were literally from from our computer screens. We we, we were doing the post. It, it yeah. was it was in, it was amazing. Getting a tour of your house. We're gonna walk and talk. <laughs> right, get my dog out. <laughs> It's a lovely kitchen. I like it. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm a bit later. <laughs> um, but yeah, to Ben, that that was a, a very big challenge for on our side of things because we're 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 sort of helping the conduit to get those images to people, and and that was always the biggest challenge. Is like, are we looking at the same monitor? Are we calibrating our computers the same? So sometimes we try to get the same exact monitor there, but still. Um, but yeah, like something like QTech or or or, uh, or encoders, proper encoders. Uh, outside of Zoom with their compression, even though you can get a pro account and do HD, it's still got a, a different, you know, artifacting and all sorts of stuff. So when you're going directly from a more professional uh, engine like that, as far as a, an encoder decoder situation, you're going to have a much truer picture, um, and it's much easier to see those sort of changes. The, 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 the challenge is though, uh, looking at it from different monitors because one person's seeing something and they might have some sort of crap Toshiba TV from 25 years ago, and you're going. Oh, yeah, it looks you know, but actually, that 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 was always the problem anyway. So when we were sitting True, in the yeah. suites, we're looking at it on these incredible screens. But then we go out and what you're on a shitty TV, and everyone's like, "Well, that doesn't look the same." Well, hello, no, because that costs like five hundred quid, and that monitor's like fifty grand. But yeah, in the exactly. same with sound, though, you know that, like in a sound studio, the sound is amazing. Where you go out and you put it. So I would always want. Um, a normal monitor in live TV. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the challenge of the remote production right there. Yeah. Right yeah, there. exactly. Internet hiccup there. If we weren't able to yeah. fix that problem on this panel, we would really be, it would, <laughs> it would take all the credibility away. Yeah. <laughs> well, why, why don't we get to one more audience question? Um, yeah, I think we're, we're almost out of time, but I think we have time for this one. Um, uh, how do you think remote robotic camera heads might be used in future productions in different locations? This is from Sheila SL. I mean, I've never used them, so I, I have no answer for that. But it sounds really cool. I, I want to use them. <laughs> I, I've used them uh, on a certain scale, but I, they've they've gotten leaps and bounds better in, in the last few years, and this has only brought that to the forefront. So I think um, even in situations when we go back into sort of hybrid studio situation, focus pullers, remote head operators going to be out of the room. Uh, I think that's going to help even for smaller intimate sets where we can't fit as many people in, uh, even post COVID, uh, God willing that soon. Um, or, or if it's just like, Hey, we want to clear out the set. Cause this is a very intimate scene. We, we could have just a camera operator back there. Aries doing some amazing things with their remote heads. Um, and even on the small scale stuff, like for the, for the Emmys and the globes, we sent out, um, we kind of modified these little photo heads and we're able to use, uh, still photo programming to just 
pan and tilt ahead to reframe so we didn't have to have someone go in and adjust anything. Um, and we were able to do that all remotely for PCs and Macs and stuff like that. And that was fairly easy. You know, we got to a point where I could be on cellular on my cell phone uh, across town and controlling a camera in the shop to go, oh, no, guys, I want the shot to be like this. Um, so I think that is a, a, a technology that will be utilized. Uh, for yeah, I mean, I've only ever, obviously, like Scorpios and Gizmos off, off a crane. I mean, they do exist, but, but um, I, I've, I've only used remote heads off, off of cranes. But again, amazing bit of kit. I mean, you know, 360 rotation on a cat. I mean, it's bonkers. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it sounds like there are aspects of this remote production world that might be worth retaining uh, into yeah. the post-COVID world. I, I, that, that's my sense from hearing from you all. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, go ahead, Ben. No, I was just going to say le le mm -hmm. less people on set, less clients on set, mm -hmm. let just people that don't necessarily need to be there. Crowding mm -hmm. around a monitor doesn't happen as much anymore. All mm -hmm. of those things are are certainly benefits. Yeah, I agree with that. So for us, uh, at, at, we're much more back on set, uh, as Michelle was saying, but still we have clients that are offset, so we're still doing uh, uh, remote Zooms or uh, – or encoding to put for the post guys to watch live, all that sort of stuff. And then um, for the specialty aspect was what we really do a lot of is um, just some of these control aspects. And uh, like, for instance, the black magic software that allows us to control the pocket cinemas and the micros, all that stuff has advanced so greatly that we're using that if we're up in the grid or we are doing car shoots, like we do carpool karaoke, we're able to control all those cameras on the fly or setting up Wi-Fi remote, uh, uh, bonded cellular devices, stuff like that, um, hmm. is not going away for us because it makes our lives a lot easier. Um, yeah. Instead of getting you know a lift out there to try to operate something or an adjust a camera, um, so that's really been a great advancement for us. I mean, that's been coming, but was you know super accelerated by uh, by the events uh, of all the lockdowns and stuff like that. And I have to say, uh, besides uh, all of the production community, the manufacturers really stepped up. Um, in a way that they usually don't by releasing beta technology mm. to the masses where they usually are very guarded about that stuff. We're like, yeah, hey, yeah. we need a solution now, guys. So you get your partners at Sony and Panasonic and all that, and Blackmagic, especially all those cameras, houses and ca camera manufacturers rather, are, were, were really, uh, uh, you know, well, critical. Absolutely. Critical. Yeah. That's a good and, point. Uh, point. I mean, I think, and good's got to come out of bad. So I think that, you know, hopefully production will take all of the good that, that, you know, that's been bad about this and, and turn it into a positive. Here, here. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Yeah. I, I, and I would love to, I'd love to hear more about all of your experiences with remote production. We are um, getting to the end of our time, but thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, and uh, yeah. Um, and, well, yeah, I guess that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for joining us. And, uh, <laughs> thank love, you for having us. us. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. That was a fun. Thanks for the cool. questions too. I'm, I'm scrolling through here and I know we've got, unfortunately we didn't get to as many as I'm sure you guys hoped, but thank you so much for participating. This is a lot of fun. I really appreciate yeah. it. Lovely connecting with you guys. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Hope to do it again soon. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, there we go. Uh, well, thank you so much everyone for watching and participating. Uh, just a few announcements here at the end. Uh, don't forget to join the collective at blackmagiccollective.com. Membership is free, and it puts you in the know for all of our initiatives and events. Uh, remember, if you have a five-minute or less short film, to submit that to the Black Magic Collective Film Festival. Um, over there, uh, we, have our, we have our technical people posting information about learning more about Black Magic Collective in the comments section, so you can see the links there, too. Um, you can like and follow us on social media to get updates uh, on panels like this and all the other types of educational activities that we do. And now we are going to announce a winner of the giveaway of uh, a seat of DaVinci Resolve. So if I could get that information. Um, the winner is Deborah Rosencrantz. So congratulations, Deborah. You now get a, you now have a seat of DaVinci Resolve. And then we actually have another giveaway, believe it or not. We just can't stop giving things away. Uh, the waived entry fee for the collaborative 
filmmaker's challenge. Oh, and by the way, we just got a question from Sabrina Louise Church. Do you have to live in America to join Black Magic? No, not at all. You can be anywhere in the world. Um, just sign out on our website, blackmagiccollective.com. Uh, and you can also follow us on, on social media from anywhere in the world. Uh, and can you let me know the... Ah, yes. Okay. Uh, the winner of the waived fee for the Collaborative Filmmakers Challenge is Sheila S.L. Uh, Sheila, please send your email, uh, your, your contact information to info at blackmagiccollective.com. And uh, then we uh, will we'll get that to you. So thanks everyone for joining us. And I think that's all the announcements. So, you know, we'll see you all again soon. See your future husband once, and only for a few seconds. So young. Why do you need to know? Make sure it's closed. Never step out of it. Repeat three times. Show yourself. Show yourself. Show yourself. Show yourself. Show yourself. Show yourself. Mm -hmm.